Support for the Legislative Gazette comes from New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals standing with more than 600,000 workers in education, human services, and health care with the Our Voice, Our Values, Our Union campaign. And United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. The economy of central New York and much of upstate will be transformed following the announcement this week that tech company Micron will make a $100 billion investment to build a series of state-of-the-art semiconductor fabrication plants near Syracuse. WRVO's Ellen Abbott reports. U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer says he jumped up and down with joy when he heard Micron chose the White Pine Commerce Park in Clay for the massive investment. Three years I've been trying to get this done. My dad's from Utica. I knew what New York was and what New York is and what New York can be. Schumer says that's transforming upstate into a new global hub for innovation and high-tech jobs. New York Governor Kathy Hochul agreed Micron's plans to build four separate semiconductor fabrication plants is life-changing. Something so transformative and scale and possibilities that the economic future of New York State is now beyond imagination. Micron's been looking at the White Pine site in Clay for a while now. The competition ramped up following state and federal legislation passed this summer that offered massive incentives to companies that want to produce computer chips in the U.S. and New York State. Micron CEO Sanjay Merhotra says Central New York won out for a number of reasons. The diverse talent pool here the university, the education system, the reliable clean power and water, alignment with Micron's sustainability goals, uh, and of course, uh, the support here from the state as well. Onondaga County Executive Ryan McMahon's been championing a deal like this at White Pine for years, touting the 50,000 jobs that come with it. It's everything from the psyche of the community to the tangible reality that we're going to have every local trades working on this building this project. Uh, we're going to have opportunities uh, for our underemployed to get the jobs they need. Site preparation starts next year. Construction begins in 2024. Center State CEO President Rob Simpson says this project will change Central New York for generations to come. Because when I was a kid growing up in upstate New York, I was told I had to leave to get a good job. And my son, he may leave Central New York, but it's going to be his choice. It's not because anyone tells him that he has to, because he will not have to. That's WRBO's Ellen Abbott reporting for the Legislative Gazette. New York Governor Kathy Hochul is defending a decision to buy over half a billion dollars in COVID-19 rapid tests from a campaign donor last winter. Her Republican opponents have seized on the issue ahead of November's election, and one government reform group says it merits an investigation. The Legislative Gazette's Karen DeWitt reports. The controversy centers around a $637 million purchase of in-home COVID tests by Hochul's administration last December and January. The state health department bought the tests, 50 million of them, which were manufactured by Access Bio, a New Jersey-based company. But they did not buy the test directly from the company. Instead, they used an intermediary to procure the test, the company Digital Gadgets. The owner of Digital Gadgets, Charles Tabelli, and his family members are donors to Hochul's election campaign. They contributed over $300,000. The bulk of those contributions came after the purchase orders for the tests had been signed. The transactions were first reported by the Albany Times Union. The paper also found that the state of California also bought COVID tests from Access Bio, but they did not use a middleman. That state paid only around half as much money for the same amount of tests, or $300 million less. Hochul says she didn't know that the owners of Digital Gadgets had contributed to her campaign. She says she tries to keep campaigning and governing separate. But she defended the price paid for the tests. She says it was at a time when the Omicron variant was spreading, and she was concerned about having enough tests to keep the schools open. My directive to my team was the only way we're going to get kids back in schools is to amass as many test kits from wherever you need to get them. Just go do it. That was my only involvement. The governor says no contribution has had an effect on her policy decisions, and she says she follows all the rules. The number of red flags going up here is phenomenal. 
John Caney with the Government Reform Group Reinvent Albany says there are a number of troublesome questions surrounding the deal. He says the state had access to lower price tests through other companies, but chose to buy the bulk of them from digital gadgets. The company is not an established medical supplier and had no history selling the tests. Another warning sign, Caney says, is that since Hochul was operating under emergency powers granted to her during the pandemic, she did not need to request bids for the contract, as is normally required under New York state law. The emergency order also stripped away the state controller's powers to review the purchase orders. The sad, sad reality about this is that this looks like one of the biggest pay-to-play scandals in New York City state history, and the truth has got to be gotten to here. Caney's group is calling for a federal civil and criminal investigation of the deal. Federal pandemic-related subsidies were used for the purchases. And Hochul's opponent in the November elections, Long Island Congressman Lee Zeldin, a Republican, is highlighting the issue in a campaign ad. Hochul rigged a lucrative COVID testing contract for a large donor at twice the price. Zeldin, at a recent campaign appearance in Rochester, called it blatant pay-to-play corruption. No evidence at all of Kathy Hochul trying to negotiate a better price for New York taxpayers. No evidence of Kathy Hochul going to the company that actually manufactured the COVID tests to try to get a better deal directly from them. That's what California did, and they paid 45% less. Despite the criticism, Hochul is not backing down. She continues to say that she didn't do anything wrong. I would do that all over again. I need to get people protected. We achieved the result we had. But the governor concedes there could be more safeguards in place, and she says she's aware of the importance of public perception. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. You are listening to the Legislative Gazette, a program about New York state government and politics. I'm David Gustina. Joining us now, Legislative Gazette political observer Alan Shartok. Alan, New York Governor Kathy Hochul, mm. as we just heard from our Karen DeWitt in the program, is defending a decision to buy over half a billion dollars in COVID-19 rapid tests from a campaign donor last winter. Republican opponents have seized on the issue ahead of November's election, and one government reform group says it merits an investigation. She's defended herself. It wouldn't be the first time we've seen a politician, New York or otherwise, caught up in what we would call the pay-to-play situation. Your thoughts? Well, David, is as old as politics. People want things, they give other people things. And there's a trading relationship in politics. Uh, money, quite frequently, is the number one way that people would try to get elected. And so... Those people with money put it in, and the result is that we have what I can only call moral corruption, meaning we all know what this game is about. You give money, you get something back, and it is part of our degenerate politics that that's the way that it has been and without doubt the way that it seems to be going now. Meanwhile, the president of the United States came to New York this week. Oh, yeah. He was down in Poughkeepsie announcing a $20 billion investment in IBM in New York that will help tech competition with China. It was also uh, political, as most presidential trips are. But you've got two House Democrats in a race, including Sean Patrick Maloney. You've got Pat Ryan. And all of this political capital being dropped right in the region that they are running to serve. Well, you know, there are some congressional seats which could go either way. And when the White House and its political operations see that, that is a chance that they just can't take. So they got to be very careful about how they do this and where they spend their time. You know, you only got one president, and he could go to Colorado or he could go to New York State. If he comes to New York State, it generally means somebody's worried about something because you're using a precious asset. Legislative Gazette political observer Alan Shartok. You 
You are listening to the Legislative Gazette, a program about New York State government and politics. I'm David Gustina. Democrats held a press conference this week criticizing the New York State Labor Commissioner's order to lower the farmworker overtime threshold from 60 to 40 hours over a decade. The Legislative Gazette's Dave Lucas has more. The order to phase in a 40-hour week for farm workers by 2032 was issued Friday on recommendations made by the Farm Laborers Wage Board. It has raised the hackles of upstate farmers and many elected officials who claim it will hurt New York farms. Agricultural businesses will receive a series of state tax credits and reimbursements from the state to offset the added labor costs. New York Farm Bureau President David Fisher was the no vote on the three-member wage board and says it will make it tougher to farm in this state. 113th District Assembly member Carrie Werner led an online press conference Tuesday with fellow upstate Democrats. Inflation is rampant, costs are up for everybody, and never, no place more so than on farms. The impact of rising uh, feed costs, rising fertilizer costs, rising uh, energy costs, rising fuel costs are driving up the cost of operating a farm. And the thing about farms is the farmers can't set their own prices. Werner says farmers can't control revenue as they fight rising costs because commodity prices are set on a nationwide basis. 109th District Assembly member Pat Fahey says lawmakers set up three tax credits to make the transition easier for farms, including implementation of a refundable tax credit for overtime hours paid by farm employers. There's been a lot of work done on these tax credits. This has been a couple of years in the in the making. Um, but when a, a farmer, a small farmer, when the cash flow is very, very tight to wait uh, six months or more for that, that payment uh, can be very, very difficult. New Scotland Town Supervisor Doug LaGrange is a former dairy farmer who says he was forced out by high costs. I don't think as a farmer uh, and a farm family and a business, you can expend the kind of money we're talking here at over 40, 40 hours a week and then get a small percentage of it back come April, if, if at all. So though I appreciate the intent, there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees that would carry over from year to year. You folks know this being in the legislature that not all things you know, stay forever and something like that tax credit could get voted out next year for some reason. Warner says the new policy will end up diminishing the workforce, further imperiling smaller farms. Republican Dave Catalfamo is running against Warner for the 113th seat. He says the time to assess and address what he calls a potential disaster for New York's agricultural industry has passed. Independent uh, researchers such as Cornell University is saying that, that this action is going to result in the closure of farms in New York State. It, it, it's not enough to have a press conference the day after you know bad policies come down. If you're at the table, for this, then you're supposed to affect it. And the fact of the matter is, is that upstate Democrats have been marginalized by New York City and their agenda. They just have. That There's no other way to, to articulate that. We need change in Albany. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm Dave Lucas. With a move to form unions at a number of organizations across New York State, non-tenure track faculty at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs recently voted to unionize. The Legislative Gazette's Lucas Willard has that story. Majorities of full-time and part-time non-tenure-track faculty of the private liberal arts college voted to unionize with SEIU Local 200 United. The votes tallied 64 to 35 in favor for full-time NTT workers, 38 to 19 for part-timers. The votes came after a push for unionization from the group Skidmore Faculty Forward. Skidmore English professor Ruth McAdams is a member of the group's organizing committee. She spoke with WAMC after the successful votes conducted by the National Labor Relations Board. It's the result of months and years of outreach and community building among people, many of whom didn't know each other before we started. And um, 
uh, you know, are often encouraged to see each other as competitors for limited resources. McAdams says a key concern of NTT faculty is a lack of job security. Across the college, Skidmore uses short-term staffing to fill long-term instructional needs. And so what that means is that across the college, there are faculty who've worked at the college for many years, but always on a terminal contract, always on a one-year or a two-year short-term contract that cannot be renewed. What happens when they come to the end of their contract is that, surprise, that teaching still needs to be done. So they get a new contract, but they're never renewed. There's no formal process in which our, their performance is reviewed. And it means that people, and I'm in this category, are always expecting to lose their job at the end of their contract. Another motivating issue for union supporters, according to McAdams, was pay, with tenure-track faculty making more than their non-tenure-track colleagues on average. Skidmore engaged in a year-long compensation study during the 2021-2022 academic year, begun before the unionizing campaign went public. McAdams says part-time faculty received a pay increase, but she credits faculty for bringing the issue to the college's attention. That study was undertaken after a non-tenure track faculty member raised a pointed and critical question at a, at a faculty meeting in May 2021, in which he very forcefully and I think bravely asked why non-tenure track faculty salaries were so low. According to an estimate from McAdams, a full-time incoming non-tenure track faculty member makes around $52,000, while incoming tenure track staff would earn about 70000 The unionizing effort went public earlier this spring, with organizers seeking a voluntary recognition from administrators. During a May rally on campus, some students spoke in favor of the effort, including sociology major Liana Heath. Non-tenure track faculty are not replaceable. They are integral. At the time, the college said it would work constructively and bargain in good faith if the union was certified. After Tuesday's successful votes, Skidmore College President Mark Connor provided a statement to the college community that reads in part, quote, As I have maintained throughout this process, support of our non-tenure track faculty colleagues is a priority of Skidmore College. We respect and admire their contributions to our mission. We will now move forward to bargain in good faith with their union toward mutually agreeable terms. I look forward to moving forward together in the best interests of our students and the college, end quote. With the bargaining table now in sight, SEIU Representative Sean Collins said the union would work with the organizing committee to form a negotiating unit. We'll start to survey the membership uh, to identify what the, the issues are um, across the college uh, um, you know, for both full-time and part-time, we'll develop proposals and we'll get ready for negotiations, hopefully uh, later this fall or early winter. By way of disclosure, WAMC hosts a news bureau on the Skidmore College campus. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm Lucas Willard. <music> are listening to the Legislative Gazette, a program about New York state government and politics. I'm David Gustina. The COVID-19 pandemic altered many aspects of life, including work. Teleworking expanded to multiple industries, decreasing the number of people commuting in daytime populations of metropolitan areas across the country. Using information collected by the U.S. Census Bureau after the onset of the pandemic, a data brief from the Rockefeller Institute of Government aims to predict how remote work will impact the economy and city planning going forward. The Legislative Gazette's Jim Lavulis spoke with the brief's author, Future of Labor Research Center fellow Liz Farmer. They began by discussing the data collected by the Census Bureau. Yeah, it's called the Household Pulse survey, and they launched it in the early months, I want to say April of 2020, during the pandemic. And it was largely a data-driven effort to gather and crunch as much data about what was going on with workers and, and people's movements and basically how the pandemic is affecting their lives. And then to be able to put that data out there for policymakers, for researchers, as much in real time as was possible. This household pulse survey, I've seen it cited a bunch of times, and it has been extremely extremely, extremely useful for those who want to track, you know, how the pandemic has changed our lives and what, how much of that, you know, change is going to stay. 
So they added a question on telework starting in August of 2020. So that's when the data that we have at the Rockefeller Institute begins, and it goes pretty much until August of 2022, which is the latest form of data we have. There is one difference in about about a year in, or you know, the spring of 2021, the wording on the telework question changed slightly. And so, in effect, it generally means you can still compare across the whole timeline, but you just have to be aware that that did have an effect, an impact on, you know, kind of a little bit artificially heightening maybe the telework question in the beginning and then lowering it after April of 2021. So you do see this this drop kind of across the board in April of 2021 in telework. And some of it is due to that question wording change and some of it's due to, you know, we had vaccines and people were getting out and about again. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to get to the change in the telework rate from before the pandemic to that latest data point that you cited in your brief, August 2022. What was the the change in the rate of telework? I can answer that looking at the average of the you know 15 largest metropolitan areas in the city, because that is generally where, where telework is concentrated. So prior to the pandemic, about a little over 5% of people reported teleworking. And and just to be clear, by teleworking, that could mean anything from, you know, full-time working remotely from home every single day to working from home, you know, one day a week, two days a month. So, you know, that definition varies, but it was about 5% before the pandemic. By August of 2020, when the data started, you know, when we started collecting data, it was over a third of people were teleworking. And that actually climbed up to a little bit higher um, in the fall of 2020. It was closer to 40% in, in the major cities because, you know, as we know, the, the, the virus was running rampant at that point. Uh, and then it starts going back down again. So currently in the 15 cities, as of August of 2022, the average rate of telework is just under 30%. How did the telework rates vary by annual income? So income bracket is almost a a proxy for access to telework, as we found in the data. So around the beginning of the pandemic, households that earned 100,000 annually or more were reporting telework at rates of, you know, anywhere from 60 to even 65 percent in the, you know, first, I'd say, six months of the pandemic. That kind of trickles down a bit. And currently it's around still like just under 60 percent. And when you look at that, in a graph compared with the other income brackets of, you know, 50,000 to just under 100,000 to 25 to 50,000 and then under 25,000, it is literally like looking at a cross section of strata, you know, earth strata and looking at the different layers because there is a huge gap between the 100,000 bracket and everybody else. Um, Households that earn between 50,000 and just and like under 100,000, they were teleworking around 35%, sometimes 40%, um, you know, in the the early months of the pandemic, now that's around 30%. The other income brackets, if you earn, if the household earns less than 50,000 annually, they're teleworking at rates of 15%, 20%, maybe uh, generally around 12%. So it's it's much, much lower. And that $100,000 income bracket is just, again, you know, people who earn that much money, more money, are more likely to be office workers and more likely to be in, you know, mid to upper level management and, of course, have more access to be able to do their work, their knowledge workers, anywhere that they, they have an internet connection. The other income brackets are not as able to do that in large part because they have to show up to their jobs. And what about from the business side, the employer side of things? If I'm telling my employee, my worker, that they have to come in in the future, will I have to provide an incentive? Will I have to cover the cost of their travel if some of their colleagues are teleworking? Do you think that sort of thing could be in the mix? It could be, which is interesting because I think those kinds of things used to be, I don't want to say standard, but much more common, you know, back in the way olden days. Certainly that was not a thing as common in the years before the pandemic, but I do think we are seeing this rise, the rise of the worker. Workers are able to ask for more now because of this leverage of the need for employers to fill these open slots they have. 
But I think one interesting thing that the data shows in terms of this kind of push-pull demand from those who think that we need to be more in the office, who are typically in management, and those who don't want to be in the office as much or want that flexibility, we saw, we see that in the data. Um, when you look at the remote work by employee age, um, you know, everyone's remote work, I mean, there isn't much difference except for the older bracket, 55 to 64, in who's telework in the early months of the pandemic. But after April 2021, which is kind of, you know, our barometer for like how how are things starting to normalize, you see this um, this separation. So those who are most likely to telework now are between the age of 25 and 39 or 40 to 54. So it's um, those older workers who also tend to either be um, close to retirement or um, or in management. Um, you know, those are the ones in charge. And, and this is anecdotal, but I hear this a lot from folks who are, you know, in their 40s and 30s, feeling like they are, they they want more flexibility, and they're feeling this resistance from those in management um, who want to kind of have more of a an in person work atmosphere again, you know, maybe offering telework once a week or once every other week sort of thing. And, and you know, I've seen this, again, this is anecdotal and conversational and <laughs> not necessarily uh, based on any official survey data, but you do see that in the data, this kind of separation in terms of who's teleworking, you know, by age. And, and there is a big difference between those, you know, the, the 25 to 39 age bracket and, and some of those other ones. That's Future of Labor Research Center fellow Liz Farmer, speaking with the Legislative Gazette's Jim Lavoulis. And that about does it for this week's show. We had help from the New York State Public Radio Network. For copies, call 1-800-323-9262. That's 1-800-323-9262. Ask for program number 2240. Or just listen online at wamc.org or schedule a podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And join us again next week at this same time for more news on New York State government and politics. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm David Gustina.